In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. So with that in mind, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 5. Matthew chapter 18, verse 5. And we're going to go through this verse by verse with extreme detail. And in fact, right now we're studying child abuse and how that affects a child. And our Lord's going to talk about uh, this in uh, just a few moments in the following verses. Matthew 18.5 Moreover, whoever receives one child such as this one because of my person receives me. <clears throat> now, some of the principles we need to take from this is the fact that Parents receive the primary responsibility for guarding the child's soul. And we studied yesterday how the child has no flight line, no forward line of troops, no ability to handle adversity or stress. It's impossible. A, a child can't handle uh, certain uh, things in life as adults can, and therefore the parents must act as the guardian, the primary guardian, and they therefore have the primary responsibility. Therefore, the primary responsibility should never be shifted to any church, to any school, to nothing except the parents because the parents are the greatest influence on the child's life and should be, and that means parents have the greatest responsibility. In fact, from God they receive the greatest responsibility in life when they bring children into the home. They don't bring them into the world. They bring them into the home. God brings them into the world. The parents take them home and take on that responsibility. So they function, that is the parents function, as the defense line of the child's soul to prevent the outside pressures from penetrating the child's soul. And I gave you the uh, an example that I saw on television where the children were perfectly happy in New Orleans while the parents took the brunt of the stresses uh, involved in that. And the parents were hot and sweaty and they weren't used to it. And the parents didn't have food, but they made sure that they fed their children when they could and gave them enough water. So the children were happy and were shielded. And the parents, therefore, in those cases, took the responsibility. And that means they acted as some sort of a flight line. Some of them were, of course, unbelievers. But even unbelievers who function under divine establishment can function as the flight line, the forward line of troops, for the souls of their children. Parents are, therefore, the flight line for their child's soul. And if parents do not have their own flight line in Christianity, if you're a Christian and you have not developed your own flight line, you've not developed your ten problem-solving devices, and you have not instructed them in the way of the gospel and in the way of doctrine, then you cannot be a flight line in your child's soul. It's as simple as that. And when Christian parents fail to establish a flight line in their own souls, they cannot be a forward line of troop defense for their children. Therefore, that child will probably lose their childlike faith. And this definitely occurs in child abuse. Those children who have been exposed to child abuse lose that childlike faith that they have very young, usually ages 1 to 12 is when they uh, experience most of the perception by faith. And then, of course, when they move into their teenage years, those become difficult years for the parents because uh, they're starting to pick up on things on their own and starting to come to their own decisions, while before it was just uh, they accepted everything by faith. And then after accepting everything by faith, when they become teenagers, they say, well, I know it all. And they don't. They just think that way because they've accepted everything by faith and now that they've got it in their souls, they think they're something. That's uh, something that's natural, something that occurs in every generation. And uh, and while it is related to sin, and it, it probably shouldn't be excused, it's just something that happens. So uh, the reason why families today are falling apart, and I'm not talking about unbelieving families, I'm talking about families that are believers. 
The reason why uh, families who call themselves Christians are falling apart is because there is no plot line in the parents' souls. And oftentimes what occurs is the children, um, they have no way to handle it. And they have no way to uh, have their own plot line. So when they see their own parents fighting and duking it out, and when they see their own parents going through divorce, it just about to destroys their uh, childlike faith. And that is because uh, the parents have failed in that they uh, do this in front of their children. And in the cases of divorce, oftentimes uh, one parent will try to uh, side with uh, the children and make them side against the other parent, all of which is terrible. And it's, in effect, you're destroying their childlike faith especially between the ages of 1 to 12. As teenagers, they might be able to handle it from their own resources, from what they've learned from doctrine. But before that time, there is no way they can handle that in any way. And oftentimes, it results in guilt on their part, even though it's not their fault. And oftentimes, they take a great deal of the responsibility for the breakup of marriage, even though they're not the ones, they're not the responsible party. And oftentimes, uh, this is actually a, a, a side uh, show of uh, child abuse, not the worst kind. We studied the different areas of child abuse, the traumatic child abuse, and then the less traumatic child abuse. But I can tell you for a child ages 1 to 12, any type of divorce, any type of marital conflict that goes on for days and weeks and months, Destroy it. Well, it definitely uh, brings stressors into the soul of a child, and a child should not have stressors. They should they should be just like the ones I saw in New Orleans playing in the streets because their parents were protecting them. Their parents were miserable, but the children were having a good time playing with each other and happy that their parents were around, and so they really didn't think of the situation as stressful. Even though, uh, but that's because the parents were acting as the the plot line. Now, no outside teaching of children is as valuable as the teaching that they must receive in the home. No outside teaching is as valuable, cannot be as valuable. And uh, the parents have that prerogative, and no one should stick their nose into the parents' business. It's their prerogative. And a lot of times nowadays, schools are trying to stick their nose into the parent's home. But it's the parent's prerogative. Right or wrong, it's the parent's prerogative. Now, where there is abuse involved, and that is sexual abuse, and those things violating law, of course, there must be intervention. But in most cases, um, a, a lot of, especially the school system lately, is just trying to take the children straight out of the hands of the parents. And the reason why that's happening is because a lot of parents over these last few generations have allowed them to do so by uh, forsaking their own responsibility. They've been too busy with something else. And even though the children are their responsibility, they ship them off to school and say, well, the teachers will take care of them. And then they get home and uh, they sit them down and say, well, watch this TV show. And, of course, they need direction and they need instruction from the parents because the parents are the ones who have the most influence over the children, always. Always the most influence, and that's the way it should be. Sometimes that influence is bad, sometimes that influence is good, but it's always it always belongs to the parent. And that's why God set up the system of family. And you can't hand over your children to a church thinking that the church will straighten them out. That's your job. And you can't, uh, with any type of program that a church may have, a teen class program, any program, that is, it's not the business of the church to take over in, in terms of uh, the rearing of the child, although when they become teenagers, uh, of course, if the parents uh, have the same uh, spiritual view in terms of what the pastor is saying, then of course they lead them in that direction. But if not, they do what they want, and that's the way it should be. So, uh, and also, uh, that we, that's the principle. No outside teaching of children is as valuable as the teaching that they must and should receive in the home. Now, the individual parent must 
uh, teach the child, and when the individual parent does so, there are certain restrictions to the parent, and those restrictions are listed in the Word of God. And while we will not get to these passages as of yet, we will later, it's all related to what Scripture has to say and how the rearing of children must be done, especially the instructing in terms of instructing them concerning the gospel, instructing them concerning certain basic doctrines. You must not be disturbed by anger. And it's very easy to get ang angry at children, but uh, if you're going to discipline them, wait until you cool off and then discipline them. And that discipline should usually be administered by the belt on the hiney between the ages of 1 and 12. Now, when they become teenagers, those spankings have less and less effect. And uh, it might be more effective than yelling at them, but uh, by this time, it's uh, it's too late. They're starting to make their own decisions. That doesn't mean you can't intervene. Of course, you should. It just means that uh, they're really starting to move out on their own uh, once they get into the, especially the later teenage years. So the individual parent-to-child teaching must never be disturbed by anger, by screaming, or by yelling. Although it may be tempting, it should not be disturbed by screaming or by yelling. And these things actually can if uh, if they are... Now, some of the things that I've been bringing up, uh, they've been tantamount to child abuse, but there's two different levels, remember. There is the traumatic level, and then there's the less traumatic level. And uh, oftentimes what occurs with uh, some children <coughs> who have been yelled at their whole lives, uh, they start to ignore it. I mean, if, uh, if the parent has always yelled and threatened them without following through, they, they learn that uh, it's just a yelling and they ignore it. And they go on and do their own thing. And it always, uh, all, the best system is what the Bible says, and that is spare the rod, spoil the child. Sparing the rod is sparing uh, the belt on the hiney or the hand on the hiney or however you do it on the hiney. Never across the face, but on the hiney. It's a perfect place where uh, bodily injury, unless you are crazy, it really isn't going to occur. It's right there on the gluteus maximus where there's uh, an extreme amount of fat and uh, a lot of nerves to where it will hurt them. Uh, that is temporarily, but nothing that will uh, damage them physically in any way. And that's and slapping and all of that is just part of anger. When you slap a child across the face, and if you've done it, uh, well, it happens when you get angry. But if you've done it, it means that you were angry. And uh, I've never known of parents slapping a child across the face when they weren't angry. It's usually just a split reaction. They uh, made a smart remark, so slap, backhand right across the face. And uh, you may think, well, they really deserved it, and they were probably way out of line, but that's uh, calm down a little bit and then take them out and spank them and, and, uh, or uh, take them and uh, let them think about it and say, you're about to be disciplined, but let me cool off first and then let them think about it and then take them in the uh, room or whatever in privacy and spank them on their uh, buttocks and uh, you'll receive more respect from that than just a reaction in anger. And most people today, of course, think it's natural to scream at their children or to yell at their children uh, because they refuse to listen. But uh, according to the Bible, the best way to gain the attention of children, especially little children, is through the rod, not through the vocal cords. Later on in life, when they become uh, teenagers, uh, vocal cords can uh, be used uh, probably better. But as a child, remember, they don't have a flat line as a child, no way to deal with it and uh, no way to really compute anger, even though they have it themselves, that when it's directed towards them, and remember, children are always self-absorbed, it's hard for them to compute that, but they do compute a rod on the fanny, and they compute that very quickly as it hurts. I won't do it again, and if I do, I may feel this same pain, and uh, that is the most effective, not because I say so, because, but because the Bible says so. so uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. And uh, that's just the, the simple principle behind it all. Now, of course, fighting in front of your children is always a traumatic experience, especially for those children under the age of 12. And children don't like to see it. Of course, it's inevitable sometimes. Tempers will flare and the children will be around. Uh, but they really have, always remember, they really have no way of defense uh, from that in their own minds. And a lot of times they attribute guilt to themselves. 
and they say to themselves, they're doing this because of me or something else. And a lot of times fights do start because of children. One person wants to discipline another way than the other person, and therefore fights erupt. And then un- unknowingly or unwittingly, the children over here, the fight, and it's be over them. And so uh, naturally, they feel guilty. And they're, it's, a, it's a sad thing, and sometimes uh, we might forget how the children think in these situations. So the best route is to, to take the argument in the back room. There will be arguments, there will, there will be disagreements in marriage. Uh, take it away from the children uh, so that uh, they aren't exposed to it and come to some agreement so that the discipline is uniform. And the discipline should be uniform because it's not uh, usually the children will favor one or the other, depending on which one has the less disciplinary tone. And that's usually the way it goes with children. But if you both come down on the same side of the fence, then there's really no way they can play games with you and uh, they can't uh, really disturb the decision that's been made. Now, Proverbs 22, uh, 5 through 6 says this. Proverbs 22, 5 through 6. The wise sees the evil and hides himself. Proverbs 22, 5 through 6. The wise sees the evil and hides himself. He who guards himself will be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Do you see that there in Proverbs 22, 5 through 6? The wise sees the evil and hides himself. He who guards himself will be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he was when he is old, he will not depart from it. Of course, this is uh, Solomon speaking, and he remembers the instruction his father gave him when he was a young child, and his father was very interested in giving uh, King Solomon Bible doctrine. And so even though King uh, Solomon messed up in his youth, and especially all through his younger days as a young man, up until he was old. Then when he got old, uh, he remembered a lot of the things his father had taught him and went straight back to doctrine, which would have been great solace to David, but uh, David was dead by this time. So guarding self, as it says in this passage, guarding self is the function, and this is for us, guarding self is the function of the flot line. We know what the flot line is, the forward line of troops those ten problem-solving devices that we've been learning. Guarding self is the function of the flat line of the soul, and the child must depend on the parents for this protection. This is what I've been trying to tell you for the past uh, two hours. This will be the third hour. It's up to the parents for the child, one to twelve, to be the protection. Children should learn in the home long before they go to school long before they're passed on to kindergarten. And uh, some children have been known to uh, fail kindergarten. Sometimes it's because of physiological things dealing with the, they're a bit slow, uh, maybe not retarded, but just slower than other children. But in many cases, they haven't been reared correctly. And uh, they might be very smart, uh, but uh, because they didn't really uh, learn these things in the home, by the time they get to school, they're way behind the other children. So children should learn in the home long before they go to school. Now, there are many exceptions to this in terms of childhood and how many children never receive this instruction in in the home, and that deals with abuse. And child abuse is rampant in this country. It has been for several generations. And some parents abuse their children in many different ways through neglect. And there's been a lot of stories about people neglecting their own children, even very, very young children, uh, never feeding them, never giving them proper clothing, never giving them proper hygiene. And uh, uh, some of these children have been neglected all the way up to the point of their own deaths. So some parents abuse their children through neglect. Manipulation by guilt, this is a big one, and it's one that's very, very prominent. And it may be the way you were raised, and it may be the way the generation before you were raised. But manipulation by guilt is something that definitely occurs, especially in legalistic families, in which uh, there's a shame on you type thing. Uh, you did this, shame on you. You dropped a banana, shame on you. You spilt some milk, shame on you. 
And uh, this stuff doesn't uh, achieve anything except it transfers guilt to the child involved. And there's n no reason to do that. I mean, if the child spills milk and you make them feel bad about it, come, they're, they're children, they're clumsy, it's going to happen. But I've seen uh, parents and others uh, just uh, jump all over their children because they spilt a little milk. And uh, and, and uh, what, ha what has happened, then you get that phrase, don't cry over spilt milk. Uh, that phrase became popular because all the uh, children would go to school and the teachers would be there and then a, a child would spill their milk in the lunchroom and start crying and the teacher would say, don't cry over spilt milk. But they were doing it because their abusive parents would uh, go insane because they did something so trivial that really isn't their fault. They're clumsy as children. I'm still clumsy. If I cried over spilt milk, I'd be crying every day. Uh, but uh, manipulation by guilt, no reason for that. Or unrelenting criticism. Now, uh, you must be, as parents, critical of your children in the sense of knowing where their weaknesses are and knowing where they need improvement. And you can keep it to yourself, and uh, then you can have constructive criticism. That's different. But there are some parents just unrelenting in their criticism of their children. And even in uh, social settings, I've heard people tell me, you know, when I was younger, I would be well-behaved around, around my parents, and then we would go to a social setting and all the people would say, my, your children are such well-behaved children. And, and then the parents would say, well, you don't know my child. You haven't been around them. Unrelenting criticism. That's what that is. And they will harbor bitterness because of that. Uh, there's, uh, there is good and constructive criticism. There's no good and just unrelenting criticism. They don't, uh, they don't have a flat line, remember. Uh, they can't uh, see themselves as you see them and probably shouldn't in some cases. And therefore, they have a guilt complex that develops. Then there's hostility toward the children. And therefore, hostility between the parents. And this occurs all the time today. And therefore, there's really not that much protection from abuse from outside the home uh, because some of these things are cultural. Uh, some of these things, uh, while they are abusive, they're cultural, cultural and uh, not against the law. And they shouldn't be because these are things dealing with the mentality and we can't go around legislating those things. But uh, God can, uh, through you growing in grace and in knowledge, tell you how it should be done. Now, the child, what happens to the child who is constantly criticized, constantly manipulated by guilt, or constantly neglected, this child uh, has a tendency to move into either a perpetual rage. I've seen young children like that. I went to school with young children like that. And they had a perpetual rage and, and anger, a cruelty. And uh, oftentimes this is learned behavior uh, due to the fact that their parents always are in a perpetual rage. Now they feel guilty and they think that's the way life is. Or fear. Those are children that are scared of everything and it's a, a type of fear of any authority figure or a fear in some children, of course. Some of the biggest warning signs of sexual abuse is when they um, go to the bathroom on, them, on themselves, number two. And uh, uh, the reason they do that, that's a protective system to uh, keep the abuser from abusing the child. So they will uh, go on themselves and it, it stinks. So usually that, uh, that's the way they keep the predator away. At least they hope it will. And it's usually a, a bodily reaction uh, given to them by God as a defense mechanism. We will study defense mechanisms and how they work and how they work in childhood, but when they're carried into adulthood, it means disaster for that individual. Some children, as a result, uh, have hysteria. And then other children uh, develop a tremendous guilt complex and this guilt complex oftentimes uh, can and does result in uh, uh, very young people committing suicide. They feel so guilty. They feel so uh, so disgusted with themselves because their parents act disgusted with them. And they have no flat line, remember? So they look as they, the only way out they can see is to slit their wrist. And they were young people and just beginning middle school. This is usually when it comes out because uh, uh, the hormones start kicking in. They're not able to adjust well to others and they're maladaptive. And the, the people at school make fun of them. Their parents uh, make fun of them and criticize them. So they just go in the bathroom and slit their wrist 
or go home and uh, take a two or three bottles of aspirin and try to kill themselves. And this happened several times when I was growing up in school, and it happens all the time today, and it has for generations. And that's because of the failure of parents, especially Christian parents, to get with the unique spiritual life and to learn about how to act. You see, the parents don't know how to act. How are the children going to know? And, and instead of being criticized, they sh there should be great uh, care taken toward them. And that's why in Ephesians 6.4 it tells us this. Ephesians 6.4. And you can turn there if you would like to. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And I told you the things that I've been uh, uh, spitting out in terms of principles. They're all related to uh, Scripture, all related to verses in the Bible. Ephesians 6, 4. You parents, stop provoking your children to anger, but always rear them in the training and instruction about the Lord. You parents, stop provoking your children to anger, but always rear them in the training and instruction about the Lord. And uh, actually, this Ephesians 6.4 is a mandate to avoid child abuse, most definitely. And a child abuse definitely provokes your children to anger. Any form of it does. Uh, the sexual form is probably the most disgusting, and it does happen, and it's, it's probably the most destructive. But that is definitely a way to provoke your child to anger, if not then, uh, later on in life. And also the other forms, emotional abuse and such as that, uh, or, or the use of the manipulation by guilt, all of which can provoke your children to anger. That's their outlet because, remember, they don't have a plot line. They can't really be, able to be held responsible to have a plot line. It is, they are incapable uh, whatsoever to understand the entirety of the unique spiritual life. Sure, you can teach them and should teach them about Noah's Ark, and you can teach them all the wonderful stories in the Bible concerning David and Goliath, and you can give them certain principles on how to be brave and how to rest in the Lord, and they pick up on that even as little children. But in terms of having a flat line that can uh, help them handle the terrible things that occur in child abuse, it's impossible. They can't have it, so they, resor they uh, resort to anger. And anger is an emotional sin, remember, and it's representing actually the entire emotional complex of sins in that child. It expresses itself in anger, but they are feeling all sorts of emotions. Guilt. Uh, oftentimes, guilt will express itself through anger. And just all sorts of, of feelings of inadequacy, uh, all related to it, the emotional revolt of the soul, and it expresses itself in anger or in rage. Therefore, children react to unfairness, of course. They react to injustice. They react to abuse. They definitely even react to legalism. And children who have been raised as uh, legalists, uh, some of them uh, have really reacted in some terrible ways to it because uh, they were made to feel so guilty because of the things they did. Because their parents always thought that if you uh, sinned, even any type of sin, and even if it wasn't a sin, you just broke one of their taboos, that's it. That's the end of it. You're the uh, crap of the earth. You're disgusting. And they would say, shame on you, shame on you, and never let up on it. Now, if they said, that was wrong, don't do it again, or if they were to spank them and say, don't do that, that's not permitted here, that would be fine. But that they would harp on it day after day. You're, you're just, uh, you're gross. There's something wrong with you doing that. And so then when they grow up, uh, every time they sin, there's a guilt reaction. And that's what legalism brings out. And that guilt reaction is far worse than any sin you could commit because it is a complex of sins. And it's something that's destructive to the soul. And if you ever feel guilty as a Christian, you're out of line. We weren't called into this world to feel guilty. Christ took the guilt on the cross. We were called into salvation in order to have happiness. And when you feel guilty about anything, there's no happiness. And we're commanded to have the thinking of the Lord. Christ never had one moment of guilt, Enos, in his life uh, because he never sinned, but we're told to have the thinking of Christ, so guilt is out the window. Yet legalism uh, forces guilt down the throats of their children, and they react to that. 
And some of them react in a way in which they uh, go uh, straight into drug abuse or they try to uh, uh, do something to compensate and just uh, totally reject authority, totally and completely. Others go the same route of their parents, and therefore the child abuse is continued. And they do the same thing to their children because eventually they get become so self-righteous, they think they're perfect. Their children will never be perfect in their eyes. And, and uh, the, because of legalism, everything they look at is through some weird uh, perverted prism. And a lot of times, uh, legalism are, are, are thinking about uh, 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 sex among young children when they're six and seven. And any type of interaction is, oh, that's a sexual interaction. They're perverts. But that's how they were raised. And so uh, they abuse in that way and make them feel very guilty. And these things uh, will become a source of soul murder for that child, as much as other things, as much as. Legalism, I'm telling you, can be just as much of a soul murderer of children, just as much as incest. Just as much as. Now, incest definitely has its a, a specific and special uh, things that occurs with the child. But uh, uh, legalism, because of its uh, nature, because of its uh, societal acceptability, uh, these, thing, these things go unnoticed. Now, of course, incest does not go unnoticed. It's against the law, and a lot of the people can be jailed or uh, go to jail for life. And in such cases, oftentimes the victim... Uh, feels a sense of vindication, and uh, but uh, for the the child under legalism, there's never a sense of vindication, never. So just as much as, even though incest is a grotesque form, uh, but of course not accepted by society. And then in Colossians 3.21, this is uh, um, given directly to the fathers. Colossians 3.21 And this goes to the fathers, but it does include both parents. And uh, the reason why it uh, goes to the father, and while this is uh, not accepted in our society, this is Colossians 3.21, while this is not accepted in our society, all indications are from Scripture is that the father carries the heavier load in terms of the raising of the children, and, and what this means in terms of discipline. Now, it doesn't happen that way all the time. I know that. And a lot of times, uh, the way our culture was set up, the uh, mother has taken on the uh, raising and rearing of the children, and a lot of times they do a wonderful job at it. But the, the, the Scripture, everywhere I've looked, it said fathers, or it said parents. And the mothers do have a responsibility because it says parents, which includes them. But then it'll say fathers. Uh, I've never seen, and this is a phenomenal thing to me. I always thought it to be different, but this is phenomenal. It always says you fathers or you parents. I've never seen it say you mothers. But uh, one of the reasons why, it might not be because they're not involved in it. It might be because uh, they don't need as much instruction. Because it says here, you fathers. Stop embittering your children that they may become discouraged. You fathers, stop embittering your children that they may become discouraged. There are several, several ways you can embitter your children. We have went over a lot of them, uh, such as uh, throwing upon them a guilt complex, or such as uh, any type of hostility, any type of incessant criticism. And uh, uh, being constructively critical is, of course, necessary. You are the parents, and you must uh, make sure that they're corrected when they need it. And you must be critical in terms of, of, of what you think. But when it comes toward expressing it to them, you've got to be creative with it, because if you are incessant in your criticism, they will become discouraged. And they will think to themselves, I'll never do anything right, so why even try? And... Uh, and you can't be too uh, heavy-handed. Although discipline, you see, there's something... You can be the, a disciplinarian. There's a difference between being heavy-handed and being a disciplinarian. A disciplinarian can look at a child and say, you've done something wrong, you deserve punishment, therefore your punishment is this, and they follow through, th through with it. Now, as a child, the punishment between 1 and 12 should always be with the rod. 
today they have for teenagers uh, grounding and all that. And uh, if that's the way you want to go, that's your choice. But uh, the Bible has always said the rod, use the rod. And that's between 1 and 12. And if you've done that, usually when they get to be the, the teenage years, usually there's always the rotten apple. But usually they turn out to be just fine when you use the rod as the Bible says. And that is a form of discipline, and that is not discouraging for the child. That's encouraging. It encourages them not to feel guilt. Because guess what? If, you, if you're if you eight years old and you've just uh, burnt down your sister's dollhouse, and your uh, father comes out with a belt and whaps you on the butt, and it stings, you know, he's not abusive. He just says, you shouldn't have done that. You could have burned down the whole house. That's hers, by the way, and you don't mess with other people's property. Bend over. This is why you're receiving it. You did this, this, and this. This is your punishment, a lashing on the buttocks. And then bam, 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 the kid cries, and then it's over. And then guess what? A sense of relief. Total sense of relief. Now, if you hold it over their heads, and if a week later they're playing with their sister... And uh, suddenly you have an anger moment or something and you say, I remember when you burnt down your sister's uh, such and such. You're a terrible per- You're a terrible child and stuff like that. That embitters them. You're holding it over their head and it causes guilt. And some parents have been known to hold a one event over a child's head for months. Now that, um, well, it's not biblical. You may have done it and then, well... The Word of God steps on everybody's toes, that's all I can say. But it's not biblical to do that. And the biblical thing is to reduce guilt and to just uh, get it over with. They've been punched for it, move on. That's how God deals with you, by the way. He doesn't hold anything over your heads. And if He did, we would all be miserably guilty right now. And we would all be in misery right now. I mean total misery. Because of all the stupid things we've done, you know it. And if he held uh, over my head the stupid thing that I did when I was 18 and now that I'm 28, if he were to bring that back up and say, remember when you did that? That was displeasing to me. Well, that's not the way God functions. It's over. The discipline occurred, it's over. Forget it and move on. That's the way it should be with children. And if you don't function in that manner, it will embitter the children. You fathers, stop embittering your children that they may become discouraged. There are several different ways of embittering. Uh, One is uh, the manner of discipline might be off in terms of how Scripture said it should be done. There are many different ways, though. And a lot of times, especially nowadays, the father neglects the child. Or either parent can do this, of course. But today, uh, the, most of the people that are running out on the children are the fathers. And they take no responsibility. They impregnate some girl and bloop, out they go and on to another girl and never take responsibility and never see the children. So the children grow up uh, lacking a father figure. And remember, they need both father and mother. That's the way family was designed. And when one is missing from the family it causes a sense of yearning in the child that doesn't have both parents. So neglect, either by abandonment or anything else, is part of how a father can discourage their children. They want, they need their father figure and their mother figure. And if the mother abandons them, there's other issues uh, related to that. And uh, a lot of people say, well, I will not divorce uh, even though we're having trouble on the basis of the fact that I have a family. And really, that's a, you're not being selfish when you say that. But if you say, I divorce because things aren't going right, uh, remember the children. They'll be embittered by stuff like that because they have no way to handle it. Uh, There's no possible way. And uh, when they're teenagers, it becomes a little easier, but it's still devastating when they're under the same roof. And it's devastating at any point. But once they're out on their own and building a life for themselves, if it occurs, while it's devastating, uh, they might have grown up enough spiritually to understand that these things happen and it's their parents' decision and it really doesn't have much to do with them. They'll still love both the same. But when children are involved... uh, All sorts of terrible things occur because of that. And if you want to know why children are so unstable today, all the way, if you want to know why teenagers are shooting up Applebee's, it has to do with the fact that uh, their home life sucks. It's terrible. They've, their, their parents have either been through one or two divorces and they just uh, they have no sense of belonging. So they go to a gang to gain that sense of belonging. 
And that's because there's been a breakdown in Christianity of understanding these biblical principles. And instead of people being selfish and self-absorbed, they should uh, latch on to these biblical principles and say to themselves, I should not embitter my child by abandoning a marriage. Or I should not neglect my child. Or I should not uh, give them a guilt complex. Of course, discipline them, but don't give them a guilt complex. So uh, oftentimes when they're rejected, and actually Colossians uh, 3.21 deals just as much with the rejection of the child by one or the other member as it does with the wrong application of discipline. And by the way, a form of uh, abuse is no discipline at all. If If you spare the rod, you spoil the child, you're ruining the child by not disciplining the child. So it's a two-edged sword. You could just let them do what they want. That's a form of child abuse. Or you could uh, utilize the discipline in the wrong way or too harshly or in a manner that uh, makes them feel guilty for days on end and weeks on end, sometimes months on end. And therefore, it, it causes bitterness. And this is a reaction that the child has. And when they carry it into adulthood, you can't live the spiritual life and be bitter. Now, right now, we're dealing with the side of the abuser and the fact that uh, what it causes. But we will look on the other side of it uh, later on and see how the child, the child who has been abused, should uh, correct it because God wants them to correct it. And the fact that they were born into an abused home, God the Father knew about it in eternity past. He knew it, and He has provided every way every means possible for that person who has been through such terrible, horrible things to come out of it. And oftentimes they come out of it with flying colors because they don't want anything to do with their past. And they say, I would rather get with the Word of God. This is what's really bringing me the first comfort I've ever had in my life. It's the first time I've never felt guilty about anything because I know Christ took the guilt and I'm growing in grace. So it's a relief to them and they they latch on to doctrine. But it, it's a hard, difficult road back for anyone who has been abused. But God does provide the way. So the child who is rejected builds up defense mechanisms, which we will study in detail. Part of those defense mechanisms are self-righteousness and self-justification, which ultimately results in preoccupation with self. Now, you can be self-righteous and you can have self-justification and at the same time be very lascivious. A lot of the uh, children who were sexually abused as children become very lascivious, very lascivious. And uh, uh, so first of all, their, their parents abused them, and then they become lascivious, and then society says you're nothing but a slut, etc., etc. That's how they were raised. Those were learned behaviors in a lot of cases. And uh, they have to break through it by post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. Uh, But what happens with these sexually abused children, they still have a tendency to be self-righteous, meaning they justify everything they do. It doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't mean that they don't know that the, them being lascivious is wrong. They know it's wrong, and they probably feel guilty about it all the time. But they get self-righteous in the fact that uh, they start to excuse their behavior, and they say, "I'm justified in doing this because my parents did thus and so to me. I am the way I am because of my parents." Some people have gotten up and said, "I'm a homosexual because of what my parents did to me. It's not my fault." But you're still making the choice. And uh, there is a way out of it, even though when you get that far, it is a difficult road back, but it's still possible. And there are Reformed homosexuals who, uh, once they got out from under the abuse, got on doctrine, and uh, then uh, went got normal. And it's happened. And uh, therefore, uh, the important thing for anyone is to get with the Word of God. But some people have been abused so much they need to get on medicine and everything else to straighten out their life. And all of that is uh, part of the recovery. And if you need medicine, take it. Uh, Because sometimes medicine is the only way you can calm down enough to really sit down and listen in any type of teaching environment. So they justify themselves and they become preoccupied with themselves, all of which is called uh, the defense mechanisms. And we'll study in detail the defense mechanisms and how they work. And you can have defense mechanisms and have never been abused. 
In fact, most of Christendom uses the defense mechanisms, and uh, yet, uh, while maybe more than half have been abused, it, it still doesn't seem a lot of others who've never been abused use the defense mechanisms. Now, in Ma Matthew 18.6, moving from 18.5 to 18.6, Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, But whoever causes... Now we're moving to the abuser, and we're moving to uh, some of the things that happened to the abuser. Actually, we look at a lot of different things from Matthew 18.6. One of the things that we're going to look at is the justice of God, and we note that uh, nobody gets away with anything. And a lot of child abusers uh, usually die uh, quickly and horribly and at a younger age than they otherwise would have. Matthew 18.6 but whoever causes one of these little ones who have believed in me to be trapped by child abuse. This is actually what Matthew 18.6 is talking about. It's talking about child abuse. Matthew 18.6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who have believed in me to be trapped by child abuse, it would be better for him, that is the one guilty of child abuse, it would be better for him that a millstone uh, well, I'll give you what it uh, says uh, in the Greek. You know, in the millstones, they would uh, uh, tie it to a donkey and it would run around like this. So what it really means is uh, it would be better for him that a millstone turned by an ass, a jackass, because they walk around the thing. Uh, uh, that's uh, back in the olden days. We don't have those things today, but it's not a, a stone as we know it. It's a, a millstone. That a millstone turned by a donkey were hung around his neck, and he were drowned in the deepest part of the sea. This is our Lord's harsh condemnation of child abuse. This begins in Matthew 18.6. And we're going to have to take several points on this. <clears throat> so once more, but whoever causes one of these little ones who have believed in me to be trapped by child abuse, it would be better for him that a millstone turned by a donkey were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the deepest part of the sea. So if you don't solve a problem immediately, you will create new problems. And the, and the time to solve the problem is when it occurs. And if you postpone solving problems, uh, then you'll create more and more problems. Therefore, you will become self-destructive. What it's saying here is uh, if you've uh, committed child abuse at one time, stop immediately. What it's saying is stop it now. Because if you don't stop it, uh, there's all indications, which we will see later, there will be a rapid buildup of scar tissue on the soul, which is why a child abuser, if they haven't believed in Christ, is the hardest person to ever win to Christ because their scar tissue of the soul is rapidly built up, in intensified. And remember what scar tissue does. It will bring you to a point uh, where you'll be just like Pharaoh and because of the hardness of heart, he'd never be lived. Or you'll be just like an Esau who wept for salvation but could not receive it. And for the child abuser, this occurs very rapidly. And they may only be 30, 40 years old, but they've committed so many acts of child abuse that they've just sealed up their destiny and will never believe in Christ. And it's because of blackout of the soul that they have as an unbeliever and they'll never get with it. And, and God keeps them alive because God wants them to have a chance to believe and be saved. And just because they're terrible sinners, as all of us are, He does not want them to go to hell. And being a child abuser doesn't send you to hell. Not believing in Christ sends you to hell. So uh, God, in His grace, keeps that option open up until the point of death for the child abuser. But oftentimes they're taken out of the world very quickly because they repeat the same child abuse with other children. So the volition of the child cannot exceed the volition of the parents during the child's formative years. This is a principle we need to take down regarding child abuse. The volition of the child cannot exceed the volition of the parents during the child's formative years. What I mean by this is when you tell your child that a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat and a squirrel is a squirrel and you read to them those books that teach them vocabulary, 
They're not going to argue with you. They're going to soak it up in uh, what is called faith perception. They're not going to argue with you. And their volition doesn't exceed your volition. In other words, you're the ruler. You're the one with all the responsibility. And uh, therefore, the child... uh, the child might say, it's Disney World today, where your, your volition can say, no, no money. Well, your volition exceeds that of the child. The child can't go to Disney World unless you say, we're going to Disney World. That's what the principle means. Uh, you have the ultimate uh, saying power. You're the one in control. Therefore, your volition is what matters. That's why your plot line is what matters. And not theirs. They don't have one. That's why you, growing in grace and in knowledge, is what matters. And your children, while you can teach them the gospel and you can teach them basic doctrine, and you should, your volition is stronger than theirs, and uh, they do not dictate to you. Uh, Except I've seen sometimes in grocery stores, children trying to dictate to their parents. I want candy. No, can't afford it. Well, I want candy, and then flip out. And then the, the parents let the child be the one in authority. Well, that's, that's, well that is a, that's a form of neglect, really. You're neglecting to use discipline, and you're neglecting to teach them not to throw tantrums, etc. And you're teaching them how to be empowered by the emotional revolt of a soul. When a, when a child lays down on the ground that's thrashing around, they are having emotional revolt of the soul right there in front of your eyes. What do you do to control it? Spank their butts, and then they'll stop. And it teaches them no emotional revolt of the soul. It's not worth a spanking. So usually, uh, if that occurs, the tantrums stop unless they happen to be a bad apple or have some uh, physiological or emotional problem. And that does occur in some cases. And usually they become the... uh, uh, the people in society who have no hope and they just uh, they, their volition just seem to always go that way. And that's the principle of just bad apples in society. And that's why uh, under the concept of the Mosaic Law, all children who were uh, incorrigible, if by the age of 12 the, every procedure had been uh, manifested to keep them in line, if the parents couldn't keep them in line, well, what happened? By the age of 12 they're already alcoholics stumbling down the street, committing crimes, etc. So the parents would go to the judge and say, my child's incorrigible. This is how they kept out of trouble, by the way. Because you see, the children are the ones, the parents are responsible for the children. So the the child would be incorrigible. They would go up to the courts and say, I can't do anything with this guy. I've, I've given him spankings every time he did something wrong. He got drunk. I hid the liquor and gave him a spanking for that. Uh, but he's just uh, he's just mad. So what do they do? They executed the 11, 12-year-old right there. Might sound harsh, but that's what they did in the Old Testament because they're, they're like cancer. And if you let the rotten apple live, you corrupt the others. That's what's happened to our culture. We got too soft on the young people. And we did it years ago, not just now. And it has resulted in uh, looting all throughout New Orleans. Those people are bad apples. No, no choice for them except uh, a lot of them, just simple execution. That's the way they handle it in the Bible. And while it's shocking, it's actually, that's the biblical way. Yet there are so many things in the Bible that are shocking uh, compared to our culture today. Very shocking. So the volition of the child, this is the principle, cannot exceed the volition of the parents during the child's formative years. That is, ages 1 to 12 is usually the maximum formative years where faith perception is used, although they still go through formation throughout their teenage years as well. There's just a different tact used when they become teenagers. Therefore, the importance of the inculcation of spiritual uh, values in both the children and the parents. But the parents must have the spiritual inculcation first, And then they are the ones who have the responsibility to inculcate those spiritual values to their children, not the church. Now, the church has Sunday school, nothing wrong with that. And that's where young people go with other young people to learn uh, stuff about Scripture. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But always remember, the main responsibility is with the parent, not with the church. And today, most churches do it once a Sunday. I think all churches do I don't, did Baraka have it every day or every time the doors were open? 
Well, well, that's a different case. But uh, uh, there, it was available. But even at those times when church is not available uh, during the day and such as that, uh, during the summertime when you got a lot of time with them, it's your responsibility to give them doctrine, not the church. It should never be handed over to the church or the school or to anyone else. It's the parents' responsibility. So if the volition of the parents is going in the wrong direction, that is, they're negative toward the Word of God, or they, they're, the, um, what they view as being important, as uh, the Word of God is not that important, the children will, this affects the volition of the child. Especially ages 1 to 12, uh, they'll just follow you. In fact, if uh, when I was growing up, I had to sit down and listen to 30 minutes of it. Not the whole hour. Our attention span when we're young is less, and it would have done me no good. So, uh, 30 minutes. And you would be surprised the things I'd pick up on in just 30 minutes. I remember listening to the David series back when I was 11, 12 years old. And remember hearing arrogance over and over again. That's what he was teaching. Couldn't piece it all together, didn't even know what arrogance meant, until one time I wrote it in a uh, paper, because the, the teacher said, all right, we're going to write a paper. So I wrote something about arrogance, and that floored the teacher. And how do you know that word? Well, I had been hearing it every day. That's how. <laughs> but, um, and that was a, a good thing on my parents' part, to get me started in it, in the Word of God. And uh, that is the responsibility of the parent. In my case, the sole responsibility, because there were no te- uh, churches around there teaching anything any good. And one time they did send me to a church, a Sunday school, uh, thinking they would teach me stories uh, like uh, about David and Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, but I got in the Sunday school, and the Sunday school teacher started talking about uh, smoking is evil and stuff like that. And uh, uh, something about uh, if you're not a good little boy or a good little girl, God's not going to let you into heaven. Stuff that was contrary to what I had been hearing every day. So I went home and said, Mama, Mama and Daddy, uh, this, 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 she said that if I wasn't a good little boy, I'm not going to heaven. And they pulled me out of that class like that. <laughs> and that's their prerogative. Just as it's your prerogative to pull them out of any place that you feel is not giving it straight up or of what you agree with. However, if it's right, well, then the the Lord will deal with you on that. But if it's wrong, of course, you're doing the right thing. So if the volition of the parents is going in the wrong direction, it affects the volition of the child. That is ages 1 to 12. Now, when they become teenagers, oftentimes they start to make their own choices. And they they say, like David did, I want to go to church. I like it. But David didn't go to church, of course. He probably listened to Samuel a lot, and he meditated a lot on the Word, probably read his Mishnah and read his uh, Torah, as he had back then, and and got as much out of the Word as he could, uh, while his father Jesse and everyone else was buttering up to the king. He was listening to doctrine or taking it in the best way he could during those days, which would be different than we do now. Although the great Bible teacher Samuel was around, so I'm sure he learned a lot from Samuel. And that was one of the rare cases where the teenager broke from his parents and said, this is what I want to do. And it happens. Uh, But that's for teenagers. For children 1 to 12, there's no breaking away from the parents. It's what uh, they are the, uh, they're the greatest influence. And usually the same sex parent is the one who influences the most. So, for example, uh, girls follow their mother usually, usually after a certain age, and boys follow their father usually. It does reverse sometimes, but I'm just giving you in general how it occurs. And one of the funny things to watch, especially for one to twelve year olds, is uh, you really get to know the personality of the parent outside of their social setting. Because if you're having a party and the parents are there, they're going to put out their best foot forward. But then uh, the children have been in the intimate relationship, and so uh, the uh, little girl, or the usually it's the little girl, but I might be biased because that's what I pay attention to, and the little girl will start uh, um, slamming down her father. Hey, knucklehead. Hey, you idiot. Don't do this. Don't do that. I said, well, she learned that straight from her mother. Or, and I'm not talking about anybody here. I don't know about anybody here. I'm, ta- I'm thinking about, uh, I shouldn't be, but I'm thinking about some of my, I'm thinking about some of my own relatives. 
and they just bash their father all the time. Blah, blah, blah. They got it straight from their mother. They had no way of coming up with that on their own. And in some cases, it goes the other way around. And the uh, I've never, I haven't seen it, but I haven't been looking for it either. But I guess a, a young man could uh, mock her mother. I've never seen it, but I'm sure it happens. It's just uh, because I'm male and I have a bias and I'm a chauvinistic pig. I guess that's why. <laughs> so uh, we'll end it here and we'll continue with this study and we got a ways to go with it. And there's a lot of factors uh, dealing with child abuse that our Lord is going to talk about through uh, throughout this Matthew series. And we'll get to the millstone factor and what that's all about and how to solve all, this, all these terrible things that have occurred uh, in our country, in our country and around the world. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things so that we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.